This is Role Playing History, the podcast where we examine the history of tabletop role playing games. Episode 1 The Inspiration for Role Playing Games. Role playing has been around as long as humans have been. It's utilized as a tool in couples therapy, child and occasionally adult mental health therapy and treatment, in workplace training, literally in every walk of life. However, this series is about role-playing games, or as they're referred to throughout the industry, tabletop role-playing games. Role-playing games, as we will be discussing them in this format, can draw their history from war games. No, not the movie war games. Though if you're not old enough to get that reference, throw it into Google. Actually, pause this, throw it into Google, research it, and then come back and hit play. Done? Okay. We're talking about war games that are played on large maps, often with miniatures painted of the units. Now, war games have been around for a very, very long time. Seriously. Historians can trace the beginning of war games back nearly 2,500 years to the Chinese board game Go. By the way, 2,500 years is my definition of a very, very long time. But I hear what you're saying. Go isn't a war game. Really? Let's look at the object of the game. To surround or control more territory than your opponent. That's it. And when you consider it's played on a 19 by 19 square board, that's going to take a lot of strategy. So territory control and strategy. Oh, and I have to add that you take your opponent's stones when you take a space so defeating units is a third point. Combine those and you have all the basics of a war game. By the way, most historians believe Go made its way to Korea in about the 5th century and into Japan by the 7th century. From there, it didn't pick up in the West, which for our purposes here is anything outside of Asia, till around the 19th century. And even then, it was really mostly in Germany and Austria-Hungary, and then the rest of the world slowly caught on. Anyway, Go has been believed to be the first war game by nearly every historian who studies the subject. It should be noted, however, that despite the thorough reporting of Chinese history, we have no definite creator for the game, nor a definite reason why it was created. But the most popular theory for this purpose is that it was created for warriors to learn and strategize war tactics. So the next game in the war game lineage comes from India. It's a strategy game called Chaturanga, or Katur for short. Katur was first reported being played during the Gupta Empire in the 6th century. What exactly is a Katur? Well, the simple answer is that it's the predecessor of chess. In fact, the board and pieces are quite similar to chess as we play it today, as are the rules. Katur made its way to Persia in the 7th century, and its name was changed to Shatranj, and I'm sure I butchered that. This version of the game is what made its way to late medieval Europe and transformed into the game of chess that we all play today. Yep, I just said it. Chess is a war game. It is, and I can prove it. What are the goals of chess? Protect your king, take your opponent's king, or get them to resign, Utilize strategy to do so. So, much like Go, chess covers enough of the bases to be considered a war game. I'll even go so far as to venture the guess that many of us who've played tabletop role-playing games for all these years have played a decent amount of chess. Or Go, I'm not going to play favorites here. And by the way, I said for the record, I played chess. I never said anything about being worth a damn at. All of that being said, when I and most gamers talk about wargaming, what we're referring to are maps, sometimes gridded, with miniatures of units that you move around and a set of rules that help determine how attacks work, how you hit, and how you damage the other units. According to the Historical Miniatures Gaming Society, the first tabletop war game resembling what we're talking about here was invented by a fellow named Helwig, who was the master of pages to the Duke of Brunswick. In 1780, he created a gridded board 
with pieces that were groups of units instead of individual men or soldiers, and he created rules for the rate of movement of units. Now, as a quick aside, what rate of movement means is how fast each unit on the board can move. The idea is to understand the reality that light cavalry and heavy cavalry do not move at the same pace. Infantry is different as well, as are cannons, or if you're playing in a more modern game, tanks, Humvees, and those kinds of things. How rate of movement is expressed depends on the system. It can be feet or meters, or it can be squares, grids, or whatever shape a single space on the board is. Whatever that number is, is how fast your unit moves in one turn. And what's a turn? <laughs> that definitely depends on the system. And we'll get into that when we do some deep dive into role-playing games a little later on down the line. What I will say is that for war games, I've seen turns that represent a season, half a year, a whole year, sometimes longer. And that's game time, by the way, not actual time. So what Hellwig was trying to do, in essence, was bring a sense of reality to the gaming table. We'll hear that refrain a lot more as we go through the history of games. So through the rest of the 18th century, Hellwig's game was modified and adjusted, including terrain-accurate boards for some areas of Europe. But it's believed that this game was pretty much just for entertainment purposes. Various historians report that there were some who tried to implement the game for military training, but most militaries of the world at that time didn't see the benefit of using a game for real strategy. So, as we refer back to our friends at the Historical Miniatures Gaming Society, we're told that in 1811, a Prussian named Baron von Reiswitz and his son George Heinrich Rudolf Johann von Reiswitz created a new version of Helvig's game, which was called Kriegspiel. And I'm sure I mispronounced that as well. The changes they made were a scale of 1 to 2373 with a sand table. Now, the younger von Weiswitz dropped the sand table for actual topographical maps. His version of the game was printed up after he had gotten the attention of those close to the Prussian Prince Wilhelm. In fact, the prince was the patron for this project. And yes, the thought of a patron is where Patreon got the name for their site, but that's a different podcast, totally different subject. Once printed, the game was sent to every unit of the Prussian military, and it was required usage for strategy and tactics. That success led to Helmuth von Molke founding a war game club called the Kriegspieter Verein, I know I didn't pronounce that right, in 1828. By 1837, von Molke had become the Prussian chief of staff and continued to promote the game from his new position. What that did was lead to an increase in play around Prussia and some surrounding countries. In 1876, a new set of German rules were published, and this also led to an increase in the game's popularity. There's a side note here. The 1876 rule change took out die rolling and replaced it with an umpire, and it was the umpire's job to determine all of the results due to the umpire's experience, as these umpires were typically experienced military officers. Now, Matt Colville, who has an excellent YouTube channel on how to be a good game master, discusses this subject in one of his videos, and he noted that most of the umpires just guessed. He noted, and historians agree, the reason for this was that there just was such a large set of rules that were supposed to cover every possibility that the umpires just didn't read them or, frankly, care. And no matter how you feel about that, there was no question that by this point, these games were a solid part of Prussian military training. So what about the rest of the world? Well, the Franco-Prussian War spread the game around the world, as it was presumed the game was the reason that the less experienced, not as well-trained or supplied army of Prussia beat the French, which was considered to be one of the best armies in the world at the time. Now that is what I call one hell of a marketing tool. 
The game helped us win a frickin' war. I'll take two copies. It didn't take too long for English versions of Kriegspiel to come out. In fact, the first English translation showed up in Britain in 1872. By 1880, the concept had made its way to the United States, and the U.S. Navy started using it as well. The history shows that by 1900, basically every military worth its salt in the world was using the war game for training and tactics. However, there was a lull in usage right after World War I. Now, I have to admit that I can completely understand that, because if you understand your history of World War I, you understand the absolute brutality of that war, and it makes sense that soldiers really wouldn't want to play at war for a while after that. And it should also be noted that the militaries that slowed that use picked it back up in time for World War II and have pretty much continued nonstop ever since. So that's the military use of war games. But I hear you asking, what about commercial use? Yeah, all right. You probably really weren't asking that, but I'm going to go there anyway. So can you just humor me on this one? The person who gets credit for putting out the first commercial slash non-military rules for wargaming might surprise you. H.G. Wells. Yep, that H.G. Wells. He wrote a book called Little Wars in 1913, and it had rules for wargaming with toy soldiers and toy cannons that fired like little pop guns. Kind of cute. It was simple, but it was also reportedly quite fun to play. However, this trend didn't last very long as the popularity of wargaming in the home declined after World War I and pretty much stayed low through the 1940s. Now, like I just said a few minutes ago, the atrocities of a couple of world wars are certainly a more than valid reason for not wanting to play war. After all that conflict, people wanted mindless fun, not divide and conquer. So, let's fast forward to the state of California in 1955. Jack Scrubby was making miniatures for wargaming that were affordable and made of an inexpensive metal, so they were also pretty solid. Needless to say, those were both very important points at that time for wargamers. Anyway, Scrubby hated the fact that it was nearly impossible for wargamers to find each other outside of their hometowns, so he decided to do something about it. He organized the first ever miniature wargaming convention in America. Now that's a big deal, whether it sounds like it or not. I mean, there was no internet, television was still a very new technology, and most contact between individuals was by mail. So creating a convention and getting the word out was much harder than it would be today. So it was a rip-roaring success, leading to a renaissance in wargaming, right? Not quite. That first convention only had 14 attendees. But it was the beginning of networking for wargamers in the U.S., and it led Scrubby to self-publish the War Game Digest from 1957 to 1962, which he intended to be another way for wargamers to share their tactics and to find each other so they could participate in their favorite hobby. At its peak, he had 200 subscribers. So at this point, you're probably wondering why in the hell Jack Scrubby put himself through all of this for what would be seen basically as zero results. Trust me when I tell you this. This isn't going to be the last time you think of this as we cover the history of tabletop role-playing games during this podcast. In fact, there are a ton of small print publishers out there that are barely scratching out a living publishing their product. So again, why do it? Well, my answer is this, because nobody else is doing it, or at least nobody else is doing it the way these folks are doing it. For the most part, that's going to be enough of an answer. If you've got the idea to put into practice and the stones to pull it off, I say go for it. And in the case of Jack Scrubby, I would add this. When he organized the first wargaming convention in America and started publishing the Wargame Digest, he had zero people following him. So 14 attendees at the convention and 200 subscriptions, that ain't all that bad. Plus, I would argue that you have to start somewhere and Scrubby had the stones to start it. So getting back into our timeline, it should be noted here that Toy Booth published what is reported to be the first rule set for a miniature war game set in the medieval period in 1956. Now you're going to ask yourself, why is that important? 
because these rules have been noted as the inspiration for a fellow who published his own set of rules in 1971, which he named Chainmail. That someone? Gary Gygax. Why does his name sound familiar? Three words, Dungeons and Dragons. But we're going to talk about that next week. After all, that's a pretty obscure game. I'm going to bet most of you have never heard of it. Stepping back to the late 1950s, this time in the United Kingdom, Donald Featherstone began writing a series of books on wargaming. They became very popular, and they did a whole lot to grow the hobby. War Games was published in 1962, followed by Advanced War Games, Solo War Gaming, War Game Campaigns, and a bunch of other topics. And what we started seeing in the mid to late 1960s is a huge increase in published war game titles from other authors all over the world, as well as the increase of the manufacturing of quality miniatures for use in war gaming. What that means is an increase in the people that were engaged in the hobby all over the world. In 1983, Games Workshop created Warhammer. And yes, Warhammer is a war game. What makes it different from pretty much everything else we've discovered to this point is that Warhammer is its own world with specific figures for its game, which puts it in opposition, or I should say makes it different from other games. Because in traditional war games to this point, different manufacturers all kind of did the same types of miniatures for the same basic games. Yes, it's a different manufacturer, but... This one might do a tank, or that one might do a cannon, or this one might do a soldier. Everything for Warhammer is specific to its game and its world, and Games Workshop holds the keys to that castle. Warhammer evolved into Warhammer 40k, and it's still widely played around the world to this day. Okay, to this point, I've been focused on miniature war games. However, I'd be remiss to ignore the importance of board wargaming, as it's just as critical to role-playing games as miniatures. Now, before we get into the history of board wargaming, I think it's only right we need to discuss the difference between the two types of games. With miniature wargaming, the player has to buy a lot of stuff. Miniatures for each unit they're going to use. Dice, because these are used in many war games to determine outcomes. And if you're the one, quote-unquote, hosting the game, at the very least, you're going to need a gridded map to use for the game. However, many miniature wargamers choose to build their own boards using accurate topographical information for the area they're battling in. That leads to buying trees, carving rivers, lakes, and streams, and any other features such as houses, businesses that they might want to add. I would also note that a lot of this stuff needs to be painted, and that is a whole nother expense and a whole nother podcast. So in short, miniature wargaming can be a very expensive hobby. Board wargaming, on the other hand, isn't nearly as expensive. The reason for that is that everything you need to play the game is included in the box the game comes in. Cardboard or plastic game pieces, dice or cards, rules and a gridded board, which typically is on some sort of cardboard backing. Now, I'll, I'll freely admit, some of these games can cost upwards of $60 US, but when you compare that to the expenses of miniature wargaming, it's a steal. Now, the downside is that unless you are an exceptionally creative person, you're basically stuck with the scenarios presented to you in the box you buy. Now, some of these manufacturers offer add-on boxes for their games, and these typically cost about half as much as the main game. Again, it's still less expensive than miniature wargaming, and it gives you more experience for that game. Another big difference is the amount of time it takes to play a game. Miniature war games can last indefinitely unless a hard cap time limit is set. Jolly Blackburn, who writes the comic Knights of the Dinner Table, which if you're into gaming at all, is just hilarious. I, I highly recommend it. Anyway, Jolly has poked fun at this possibility on a number of occasions by writing about a miniature war game that has been going on for many, many years. However, that's, that's only partially a joke. I personally know of a couple of fellows who played a World War II-based miniature war game for nearly 10 years in real time. Not, not every second of every day, but it took them 10 years to finish the game. 
Now, I'll grant you, most games don't take that long, but they can take several weeks or months to bring to a close. On the other hand, most board war games can be completed in a night, which makes them a better fit for family game night or the weekly gathering of friends for a game and beverage. Now, I personally am more of a board war gamer, and that's primarily because of the expense and the fact I'm not much of an artist, so the painting of miniatures doesn't really appeal to me. So with that, let's get into the history of board war games. The history of board war games is relatively short, especially when compared to the 2,500-year history of miniature war gaming. Historians agree the first successful board war game came out in 1954. Called Tactics, it resembles many of the games that have been released since. The creator of Tactics was an American by the name of Charles S. Roberts. Now, Roberts created something else big in the gaming world, and if you ever spend any time in a game shop, this name may mean something to you. Avalon Hill Game Company. Most of the best or most influential board war games published since the creation of the company have come out from under the umbrella of Avalon Hill. That includes Gettysburg, Rise and Decline of the Third Reich, Squad Leader, and Storm Over Arnhem. And I'm sure I'm missing a couple. Trust me, I could do an Avalon Hill list and probably go 90 minutes, but I'm not going to do that. Now, while many of you might not have ever heard of those games, there are two more in this particular category of board wargaming I almost guarantee you've heard of. The first one is a little Conquer the World game called Risk. Parker Brothers gets credit for that game, and I'll bet good money it's one of the first non-kid board games most of us played. Though in my case, playing the game is all I can take credit for, since I suck at actually playing it. C'est la vie. The other game I bet you've at least heard of is Axis and Allies, which was originally created by Nova Games, but released by Milton Bradley. Again, this is a game that a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily consider themselves to be war gamers have probably played at least once. And I'd note, both Risk and Axis and Allies have had multiple printings over the years, and have had several alternate versions released as well. If you're interested in more information on these or any of the other games, check with your local game store. Now, first popular as both board and miniature wargaming were in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and even into the early 90s, their popularity has really been on the decline for the past 30 years. Most historians believe one of the primary reasons for that decline is the computer. More specifically, the advanced processing and graphics of a computer, which make for a better solo experience, as well as a game that doesn't require as much of an output of money to play. The internet also makes it easier for people who don't live in the same area to play games together, and an entire industry has developed to address this. However, we'll cover all of that in another show. With all of that being said, don't think for a minute that miniature or board wargaming is dead. It's still very much alive and kicking. In hobby shops and game stores around the world, supplies for miniature wargaming still make up a strong part of their income. Entire e-stores exist for the buying and trading of miniatures, terrain, paints, and other wargaming supplies. In fact, in researching this episode, I found a couple of online vendors who will create the terrain of your choice for you, then ship it to your home. So while it isn't as big of an industry as it once was, Miniature and board wargaming is still here, and I'd argue that it is here to stay. So that's it for this week's episode. Next week, we'll explore the history of the granddaddy of the tabletop role-playing game, Dungeons & Dragons. And as we wrap up this week's show, I'd like to take a minute to both welcome you to the show and thank you for taking this chance with me. As somebody who's been a gamer for more than 35 years and a fan of history for longer than that, I wanted to combine my two hobbies into something that I myself would want to listen to, and I hope that over time you'll want to keep listening too. To give you an idea of what the plan is for this show, I intend to work my way through the timeline of tabletop role-playing games, stopping to discuss as many games in long form as I can along the way. This, by the way, is where you come in. If you've got a game you'd like me to research, you can email the show at roleplayinghistorypodcast at gmail.com. 
send me an email. I'll see what I can do to bring your request to the show. You can also email your thoughts about this episode, as this is as much your show as it is mine, and I want to keep you as entertained as I can. I also want to take a moment to shout out to the Historical Miniatures Gaming Society, Matt Colville and Jolly Blackburn, all of whom I reference directly in this podcast. And by the way, I follow Matt Colville on YouTube. Punch it in. It's a great watch. Jolly Blackburn, I told you about his comic. Anyway, great stuff to check out. Also, a final shout out to my wife and daughter who are supporting me in this little dream of mine. I do love you both. Again, that's it for this week. Next week, we discuss the history of both the Dungeons and the Dragons right here 